So I'm very excited um, today about Journal Club. This is January 2024. So thank you for um, participating to start the new year off with a very important topic. Um, we have two great speakers to lead the, this discussion on Beyond the Model, Minority Myth, Unveiling Anti-Asian Asian Racism in Medical Education. Um, we have Lou Miller, who is actually one of the deans at the medical school, and he does um, total advising of 400 students for their life career. It's pretty amazing job to have to guide 400 students through their life career. Um, hopefully very rewarding. And we also have Grace Lee here, who is a family head at the medical school, a preceptor and clinician in um, internal general internal medicine as well. So deals in the primary care world, and she'll be here as the discussant. We do have some questions posed in between, or actually a start-off question will come up in a minute. And we're looking really for participation. So um, I really am so excited about the amount of people that are here today, and um, especially starting the new year with us. So I'm going to turn it off over to Lou to start, and, you, and we'll intersperse. If you want to put any comments in the chat, please do that. If you have a question, put it in the chat and I'll monitor the chat. And of course, always raise your hand if you want to ask a question as well. And um, we, have, we have plenty of time for the presentation and then some interspersed questions. And then of course, general questions at the end. So Lou, take it away. All right. So um, it is a pleasure to be here. And it Just is a turn up your volume a little, Lou. Uh, this is on, on your is that better? Yes, yes. Okay. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here and it is a pleasure to give this talk. Uh, I am a cardiologist. I am on service. So hopefully the interruptions will be minimized. We are not talking about cardiology today. We're talking about something that is um, you know, near, clearly near and dear to my heart, but um, something that uh, I've, I've grown in interest over the last several years. And um, I'm excited to be talking about this uh, Journal Club article. I'm slightly disappointed because we are undertaking a very similar study to this uh, article and this study um, at the medical school in collaboration with some folks from Uniform Health and Emory, but that's okay. We will we will get uh, get through this. So, um, first off, I have no financial uh, conflicts of interest or sort of disclosures to make, but I did want to briefly share two short personal anecdotes about myself to let you know where I'm coming from, you know, to this discussion, and hopefully encourage some personal and honest and potentially courageous dialogue today. So, so the first is when I started my third year of medical school, I started on all things neurosurgery. And on the first day of my rotation, the chair of neurosurgery grabbed my ID and read Lewis Miller and looked at me and then without missing a beat said, how the hell did that happen? And so that brings me to my first point. Uh, I am a Korean American, uh, I am a you know, Korean born adoptee. I, I immigrated to the United States when I was three months old as an infant, I was raised by white Jewish parents. And so if there is any truth to the idea that Asian people can experience white privilege, I certainly would be the poster child for that concept. Secondly, as a first, my, my other anecdote is as a first grader, I learned that uh, that was a time where I learned that I could never be president of the United States. And upon learning this, I was so inconsolable that the school had to call my mother to bring me home and take me out of school and bring me home. And in reflection, I don't think this was about me and my six-year-old mind thinking that I was ever going to become president of the United States. But I think it was a reaction to being told in a very concrete way that no matter how much smarter or how much harder working I was than my brother, who is my parents' biological son, that I was not allowed to have the same dreams and aspirations that he did, and that I lived in a country that um, seemed to be perfectly fine with that idea. So with that, I will start the uh, journal club. and. Start with a probing question. And so when we use the term racism and discuss anti-racism strategies, you know, how, when you, if you think to yourself, how often do you actually include Asian Americans in your thought process? And so think about this, 
you know, if every, anyone wants to comment, certainly uh, you can. This could be a, this could be an hour long conversation, probably, in and of itself. Does anybody want to share anything just to get us everybody in the mental space? I think Lou just shared two amazing stories, and I thank him for his courage and um, sort of self identification and location of self. We call that um, is really essential to this conversation. Anybody else? Or Grace, would you like to add anything thinking? Tom, I see a hand. Is that a hand? Yes. You know, I never thought of this until COVID. And it seems like there was an, a significant um, amount of anti-Asian racism following COVID. And I guess after that, I realized it, the, or I assume, not assume, but I, started thinking about anti-Asian racism, which I never really thought of before. For some reason that really precipitated my thought processes. Good point, yes. I, I would like to make a, um, a, a response to what Lou mentioned, um, which is that hearing what he said made me feel very sad. And at the same token, realize that I have been quite um, reticent and quiet about ever bringing up experiences like that, experiences that he, me, and maybe other Asian Americans have experienced. Thank you. Thanks, Grace. And there is a comment in the chat, just to be An Angela or Angel. Angel, I'm sorry if I got that wrong. I think pre-COVID anti-Asian racism was not widely talked about, possibly because it did not align with the model minority myth. Interesting. And I mirror Dr. Miller's experience. I'm a Filipino-American. This is from Kenneth Brentana that grew up in a largely Caucasian neighborhood, 97% Caucasian. And my name is is Kenneth Britannia. So when the teacher called my name and a Filipino boy raised his hand, the teacher would say my name again, looking for somebody else. Right. So a similar experience. Um, thank you I'll for sharing. You um, oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I was going to say I often get uh, the the look of where is Dr. Miller when I enter the room. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I get that so, too, whereas the Asian, <laughs> when I enter the room, so it's, I married into, I married an American born Chinese gentleman who's just fantastic. And he has made me more aware of these issues. And so yes, of course, I always consider Asian when thinking about racism, but you know, there's a lot of assumptions because I do have a last name that doesn't match with my background or who I am. And, and there are people who will constantly joke with me, like, don't you feel Asian now? Or don't you have an Asian perspective? And I wish I could be so lucky to have much more of a, per a perception of being Asian because I married into a family, but I only know their experience. And, and I, it's been an interesting journey and transition for me as well. Do you have children? We do. We have three wonderful children. This is their art behind me. I figured <laughs> and, um, that. That's why I was able to ask that. Yes. I mean, the question, it's very interesting. I'm, I'm, I sometimes get the nanny comment, uh, because my children don't look at me, look like me very much. And, uh, I've had people come up to me and say, Oh, your baby's so cute. Is he American? And I'm like, of course he's American, you know, like what a, so we, we get all kinds of interesting comments. Um, even though I look the way I look, my family doesn't really look like me and my name doesn't look like me either. Well, thank you. Um, Joanne, um, you, I um, hope I don't mess up your name, Hsu, or not. Growing up, I was always told by my parents to not complain about any discrimination or draw any attention to myself. If others have the similar experience, it could, this can contribute to the lack of perception by others that discrimination and racism to Asians is an issue. Thank you for sharing that. Um, sort of why the message has been hidden. Okay. Lou, I think we do need to progress though. We could talk all yeah, yeah. this okay. question. So <laughs> um, I wanted to put it here to get everybody activated. And I think we accomplished that. 
Awesome. All right. So um, moving on. So the learning objectives of this, this session are, so by the end of this session, you should be able to describe the forms and mental health implications of racism against Asian American medical students, including microaggressions, feelings of invisibility and isolation in medical school environments. I think two is to identify and evaluate or us to kind of discuss potential strategies for medical schools and health care institutions um, you know, that they can implement to support Asian American students, promote diversity and inclusion and foster allyship and advocacy. And third, I think it's to examine the current institutional practices, you know, and responses to racism that, you know, um, and ways to improve these, uh, particularly in the context of the broader societal issues like that were, were just mentioned, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic and the rise in anti-Asian sentiment. And so I'm going to start, you know, with a, a somewhat longer background than I traditionally like for journal clubs, because I think there's a, a fair amount of history that is not necessarily talked about so often, but the primary context for this article and the study that the, the, these authors undertook was really the COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, in the years from 2020 to 2021, there was this very significant, significant increase in anti-Asian hate crimes. And so I, I picked a couple of, you know, pictures, uh, you know, taken from, you know, surveillance footage of elderly, mostly elderly Asian people um, being attacked in broad daylight. Uh, some of these pictures are actually of uh, Asian Americans being murdered. Um, and when I think back about this time period, I think back to, you know, how I felt. I didn't know what the statistic was, but it felt very much like I was very specifically under attack. And it, this, this is what my Instagram feed really looked like to the point where I, I basically had to stop looking at social media because it was so, so distressing. And I, I think that many Asian American people had similar um, experiences during the, this time period in the, the pandemic. I think it's also worth noting that this was also occurring in the context of the murder of George, George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement. And so we were talking about racism um, very prominently during this time period. Um, but it wasn't necessarily always, you know, Asians weren't always necessarily included in that conversation. This also uh, occur, or the, occurs in the context of the Atlanta shootings, um, where uh, many Asian women were, were murdered. Um, and while that might have seemed like a far off event that felt very, very real to a lot of our, our community members, and I, I will point out that there was a, a separate shooting in uh, Dallas, uh, Texas, in uh, the Korean community there, uh, which really touched, you know, the Northwell family and uh, our fellowship in, in that one of the, the uh, victims was actually the mother of one of our fellows. Hmm. But this is not a new happening. And so anti-Asian racism and violence against Asian people has basically existed since Asian people, you know, were in this country, and Asian people have almost always been in this country, you know, um, starting to at almost the point where th this country was started. A lot of this uh, occurred against specifically uh, Chinese immigrants um, that were working in, in the country, um, but it was perpetrated by um, some of the, the uh, organizations or, or usual suspects that we would think about in terms of uh, other um, anti uh, you know, racist or, or racist violence in terms of the Ku Klux Klan and others, and resulted in into similar violence like um, lynchings. There was also a very sh sort of uh, directed structural anti-racism, um, Asian racism that was perpetrated in, in mostly the form of laws, and so it was really illegal for uh, Asian, you know, or Orientals to become uh, naturalized citizens. It was also illegal for you to own uh, any kind of property. It was illegal for you to bear witness in court. Um, you know, there were laws that excluded your uh, immigration eventually, um, first, you know, mainly focusing on women and then also uh, focusing just on China and then all of Asia. And this was the state of the, the, the legal framework for the Asian American experience or Asians in America um, in, until around World War II. And in World War II, ironically, what happens is you know, we start fighting the Japanese. The Japanese Americans are then interned for for many years. And in this, in, in the post World War II era, because we were fighting the Japanese, and the Japanese were then saying, you know, look, you know, Asian people, look, you know, this country is has always been uh, had an anti-Asian bent. The the 
the dialogue around Chinese people specifically started to change. And so the laws started to be repealed in terms of the quotas um, that were restricting uh, Asian uh, uh, people to immigrate to the United States. Um, and the dialogue started to change around Asian people. In 1965, the Immigration and Nationality Act was passed, and this is when the quota system was abolished. It emphasized family re reunification, but it also encouraged preferential employment clearances for selected preferences, some of which were based in engineering and science and in medicine. And I think that it is important to, to recognize that while um, you know, people that were immigrating at this time uh, may have had degrees, they may have been trained in a professional kind of way, they're still coming from countries at this time of history where they probably are not coming as wealthy, you know, rich doctors, um, but they, they certainly are moving with qualifications that um, did set them up for, for, for some degree of financial success in this country. But this is the context in which the, the model minority myth actually starts. And so in 1966, basically during that year, after all of these restrictions are um, abolished and, and people start to, start to immigrate to the United States, um, this was published in US News and World Report. And so at a time when it was being proposed that hundreds of billions be spent to uplift Negroes and other minorities, the nation's 300,000 Chinese Americans are moving ahead on their own without, with no help from anyone else. And so you can already sense that both Asian people are being pitted against other minorities. And that, that this is probably not necessarily true that you know, the, the change in the laws facilitated movement of um, you know, high, highly trained uh, potential professionals um, that happen to be Asian in this country. When you look at people that actually buy into the model minority myth um, and racial color blindness, these people also hold the perspective that Asian Americans are, are more likely to hold the perspective that Asian Americans are perpetual foreigners. They're more likely to hold unfavorable prejudicial attitudes towards Asian Americans. And so just because the model minority myth is actually sort of couched in being positive, um, it is actually still a reflection of race, racism. Now in medical school and medical education, we are faced with this unique tension or kind of conundrum in terms of the fact that in medical school, I think it's not a surprise to people that Asian Americans represent a, about a, a, a quarter of students in medical school, a fifth to a quarter of students in medical school, but Asian Americans in this, in this country represent about 6% of, of the population. And so in some, you know, in, in some ways, Asian Americans are overrepresented in medical school. And so the, the mere presence of Asian Americans in medical school at, at this proportion is really potentially a phenomenon that reinforces this model minority myth. And so we are faced to kind of deal with and grapple the fact that um, you know, this, this tension uh, does exist. But I think it's important to realize that there's actually no evidence that the model minority myth is true. And I think if you think about it, it really masks the needs of Asian Americans as students as a population and potentially as our own patients. So if you look at the data about academic performance across racial groups in colleges, you know, once you control for a, a number of uh, um, metrics, Asian Americans actually have lower GPAs. They are more likely to be on academic probation. They are more likely to withdraw from school for medical reasons, most of which are mental health reasons, and they are more likely to not graduate. When you think about why this might exist, there is this concept of a stereotype threat. Um, this is usually thought of or invoked when we are thinking about negative stereotypes, but if you look at the data about the positive, potentially positive stereotype of the model minority stereotype, it also has negative impacts on, you know, on, on performance um, in, uh, in, 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 in studies. And then you look at kind of how Asian Americans fare in medical school specifically, and you look at the likelihood of Asian Americans to become um, AOA or nominated for AOA, and you can see that it is significantly lower than um, compared to our white colleagues, to our Hispanic colleagues, but it is uh, also higher than our, our, our black colleagues. This is sort of a disturbing and, and something I didn't actually know until I started you know, getting interested in these topics, but within the age group uh, uh, that you know, we are charged with you know, are interacting with our students, you know, um, if you look at the leading cause of death for Asian American 
students in, in our age group. Um, suicide, intentional self-harm is actually the number one cause of death in, in Asian Americans in this age group. And this is the only ethnic and racial demographic for which that fact is true. And so that, that gives me some pause as well in terms of how are we supporting our students and um, how are we addressing you know, these potential tensions. So I apologize for that long intro, but we are finally to our article. So this is the article that we're, we'll be discussing, Experiences with Racism Among Asian American Medical Students. Um, and this was published at, at the JAMA Network uh, Open uh, last year. The objectives of this study was to really describe how Asian American medical students experience discrimination, specifically during the impact of Asian hate and, and during the COVID-19 pandemic, and to describe stakeholder-derived uh, strategies uh, that promote a more inclusive medical school environment. And so this is a qualitative study, and we're not necessarily used to, to uh, talking about a lot of qualitative studies, so I apologize. Uh, I'm going to go into a little bit of detail for this. But this, this qualitative study was done by one-on-one -on -one semi-structured video interviews via, via Zoom, the, the platform of choice. Uh, inter there were two interviewers that followed an interview guide initially. This interview guide was then piloted and iteratively revised throughout. The sessions were audio taped and professionally transcribed, and data was collected until a concept of theoretical sufficiency was met, and we'll talk about that. And it follows basically the usual reporting guidelines for qualitative research. Uh, the participants were selected via um, sort of this theoretical sampling model, uh, and basically uh, their, their, their way to recruit participants was to use a PAMSA, the listservs and social media from, from a PAMSA, and then once they got their initial set of people used a, a method called snowball sampling, which basically the existing participants within the study then recommend additional people that they think could qualify as participants. The analysis for this study was basically a constant comparative method to identify a grounded theory, and I'll go a little bit into this, but what basically uh, happened was that each transcript of these interviews was then coded by at least two, the, those two investigators while the code book was being refined. Um, all of the transcripts were then independently recoded by an additional three investigators, and this is pretty standard. And the, the, the steps for coding, you know, they're described in the paper, and, and so they are called open coding, axial coding, and selective coding. And what this process is, is, uh, is sort of identifying some initial codes, association between these codes, and essentially then developing themes. This was the software that they used. I actually don't know anything about this software, but there are a variety of different software packages that can help you, um, you know, manage the, the, the qualitative data that you are producing. To, to briefly kind of give you a, a better sense of what grounded theory is, grounded theory is a qualitative research methodology in which investigators collect and analyze real world data in an iterative manner to develop theoretical frameworks. And it, it's sort of strange because it's it's sort of the opposite of hypothesis testing or the scientific method. So, you know, when we develop hypotheses, we and then develop experiments to test those hypotheses. This turns it on its head, and you collect data first. <laughs> so you collect all this data, you do a bunch of interviews, you get those transcripts, and then you analyze those transcripts. You sort them into different pieces of those transcripts, which is that open coding process. Then once you do that, then you start to look for associations between these pieces, which is that axial coding or categorization of these pieces. And then once you do that, then you're looking for how these, these larger pieces or categories start to interact and arrange themselves as potential themes that explain some kind of phenomenology that you're trying to explain. And the data is constantly being compared. You're taking notes, you're making memos, all about the, the codes, the categories, and the way that they interact potentially. Um, and, and that each step of this data analysis, you go back to the drawing board and think about what other data is needed or who else we need to, to sample. And so this is why it's called theoretic sampling rather than just kind of study participant recruitment. So you, you may be going after very specific people you know, based on what data you think you need um, based on the data that you've already uh, you know, obtained. And that the data is basically co collected you know, until the theoretical saturation is reached. And what is meant by that is that you reach a point at which collecting additional data is no longer adding to your understanding, meaning that your theory or the theoretical construct that you've made 
will start to predict what your participants will say. And so when that starts to occur, then you basically have reached um, this, this saturation point and you no longer have to go out and recruit more people or, or get more data. And so it's, it's a very different kind of way of doing, doing research. I tried to make a diagram to illustrate this. I'm not so sure if I was successful, but really central to this process is data co collection. And then this, this sequential process of open coding, actual coding and selective coding, but you always go back to that central process of data collection. And then ultimately you're trying to derive a, a, a unifying theory that is grounded on your observations and it's grounded theory. And so, sorry, that was a bit long-winded, but um, are there any thoughts that, that anyone has about the methodological design setting or participation, uh, participants um, potentially in this, this qualitative study? I wanna thank Lou for giving us a brief overview of qualitative research, and he did a wonderful job just to let you know. This whole idea that you generate theory from your data, that's the real difference with grounded theory. Usually we go in with theory and we get data out. So it's it's a reverse process. Any thoughts on using qualitative for this study versus mixed methods, which would qualitative and quantitative, or just using quantitative, what would be lost? Any takers on that? Thinking about research methodology? What did we lose by only doing qualitative? Did we lose any, or did we lose anything by not having a quantitative component? Um, we do have something in the chat. Let me get there. How bias control for the, how is bias controlled for? Um, so how did they talk, did they discuss bias control at all, Lou? They discuss that, you know, the bias control for, you know, this kind of qualitative research is essentially, you know, um, is the anonymity of subjects. And, you know, there is some kind of social expectation biases in terms of what you sort of say. Um, so that was spoken about, and there, there was kind of talk about whether or not, you know, the initial reach out from a PAMSA and subsequently I'll show you who they recruited. Um, you know, whether or not that that also induce, you know, introduces some kind of bias. And they didn't really talk about, you know, um, uh, uh, how to counter that. So with qualitative interviews, of course, you do less data collection in the sense there's only so many people maybe you could speak to versus a quantitative survey. You know, you could get a mass email out and maybe get some data. So that's one thing. Um, Pratichi, did you want to add something to this? Yeah, I was just wondering, since this is, you know, relatively novel in terms of the area of study, often when you're using quantitative methodology, you have some basis in the literature to determine what your survey items would be, what the themes that you'd be assessing. But because this is an area that's fairly, that's not as well studied, I like the idea of letting the participants' responses, um, you know, derive the, the themes, because I think this will then inform future mixed methods or quantitative studies at the larger end. So um, I think just in terms of the, the methodology, this makes sense to me. And Doreen wrote in the chat, and she is an educational research expert. I'm going to call her an expert. They are structured ways to minimize bias using methods such as triangulation, keeping a careful record of decision, and using multiple quarters and constant discussion among the PIs and the coders. That's true. So it's a very iterative process, the qualitative. So that helps. And I just want to say that you can take a qualitative approach and then eventually construct a quantitative tool that would lead to a quantitative study. You see what I'm saying? So the qualitative study could inform a qualitative, a quantitative tool. Wendy, did you want to say something about this? Yeah, I had a question about um, whether the participant, they accounted for like generations for the, from the participants. So like first generation versus, you know, second, third, fourth generation, I think the experience starts to change based on which generation you are. Um, and I didn't see it in the methodology, but I, I'm not sure if they accounted for, for those nuances. And then Thank you. We could let we're gonna look in a minute more deeply, and then they use the snowball recruitment, which is very common for qualitative research. So maybe we should move on, Lou. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, and I, we'll see. You know, uh, we'll get an answer kind of to your question, Wendy. But but certainly, they focused on medical students. They didn't necessarily focus on focus on residents. They didn't focus on faculty. Um, you know, which might have been additive. Uh, I think they were really focusing on the medical school experience. Um, but uh, adding those generations or kind of quote unquote generations might have might have been added and it's something that we are trying to include in our, our study. So that's how it's different. Uh, in terms of the results of the, this, this study, in terms of demographic characteristics of the participants, uh, you know, uh, I, I tried to lay it out here. Um, uh, basically, it was a slightly predominance of, of uh, women versus men. Um, it tended to be more in the clinical year, so MS3 and MS4 versus MS1 and MS2, about a uh, one-third to two-thirds. Um, almost everyone was involved with a PAMSA, which the, the authors bring up in their discussion as potentially a limitation, you know, whether or not those are truly uh, a representative sample of people um, being involved in a PAMSA. Um, the, there were many uh, self-identified ethnicities within, you know, the larger umbrella term of being Asian American, and you can see there that there was a, a number of ethnicities uh, that were included. Most of the participants in the study were born in the United States, so that gets to sort of maybe a little bit about that generational question that, that Wendy just brought up, um, and only four people were in, uh, born outside of the United States, and it was a relatively um, you know, even distribution in terms of where the students were located in the country. And so the, all of the regions uh, were, were represented. So in looking at the, the themes, you know, we don't have data charts, we don't have Kaplan-Meier curve, um, which is great because there was no uh, <laughs> a bad outcome, but uh, we have themes. And so the, the primary themes that uh, the, the researchers observed uh, were, were, were documented as such. And so the first theme was invisibility, and that 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 Asian American students, uh, you know, experience invisibility, and this is um, considered in the, in the mind of the the uh, authors as a, a microaggression. You know, there is also a a visible uh, discrimination that people face, um, and this was thought of as more of an aggression and not necessarily a microaggression. There is the absence of the Asian American experience in medical school um, that came up uh, multiple times. And that another theme that was raised was that um, Asian American students felt that they were ignored when they were trying to seek support for what they were experiencing. And then I think by design, there was a theme also about, you know, that students brought up about how to envision the future and what to do about their experiences in um, medical school. And based on these themes, there were also sub themes that emerged. You can kind of look to see, um, you know, what these look like or what these are. Um, some of them are uh, a little bit more self-explanatory than others. Um, you know, in, within invisibility, there was some sense of a mistaken identity. There's always the question of where are you from? There was some concern about gender discrimination. So visibility, uh, especially the idea of being a carrier of disease or a foreign enemy, the absence of uh, the Asian American experience in medical school from admissions through the curriculum as well, and then and the minority tax of if there was a hole, you know, being asked to fill it. Um, you know, ignored uh, while seeking support. Um, there were barriers that, that students pointed out. There were, um, you know, feel, feelings of isolation and limited kind of larger responses from a medical school, you know, hierarchy or, or sort of leadership uh, responses to the anti-Asian hate. And then what they envisioned as part of the future, and we'll talk a little bit about this, but that some of it re revolved around education, a concept called disaggregation, um, as well as, um, you know, showing uh, more representation amongst leaders, as well as um, encouraging allyship. The last way that data is presented uh, uh, many times in um, qualitative research is representative quotes. And so I wanted to stop and ask the group, you know, were there any representative quotes that you read in this paper that either surprised you, that resonated with you, that recalled for you what you had heard or discussed with students or moved you in either a positive or a negative kind of way. Um, and I picked one that uh, spoke to me, you know, that our Asian friends and are checking in on each other, but no one outside of that racial group is checking in on us. And this certainly was a, um, a sentiment that I, I heard articulated by students um, during this time period. And, and so that was something that specifically did resonate with me. I wanted to, to see if anyone else had um, any reactions to some of the, the quotes in the paper. 
this is the time for audience participation. And Grace, if you have anything you want to say, please chime in. Sure. Um, it, it, I would like to start um, this discussion by um, my experience with the the COVID and the the aggressions that were noted. Um, and it surprised me when I did approach medical students and I actively asked them how they were doing and how did they feel about what they were seeing in the news, that they were very open and um, were willing to share. But before I approached, I wasn't hearing anything. There was silence. You know, people were afraid to say anything unless they were approached about the topic. Um, only then would they feel comfortable in um, discussing their emotions and feelings and, and anxiety over it. And I thought that that was a salient at that, wow, you know, it is on everyone's mind, but yet no one were talking about it. And, and, and why? Was it out of fear, feeling like they weren't worthwhile to be discussed? Um, and so, so that was a salient to me. Other thoughts? I can't see everyone, but I will. Let me move just make on. sure there's nothing. Just, I don't see oh. a comment in the chat um, at on. this point. All right. Um, okay. So one of one of the ahead. ways that I think about sort of the data and sort of what came out in terms of uh, this is, you know, I think the overall Asian American students' experiences with raci raci racism, microaggressions, you know, actually, when you compare them to other mi minority groups in medical school, they're very similar in some ways, but there are, I think, some specific differences that are actually worth considering. And so the similarities are, you know, this common theme that there, are, there is a negative mental health impact of, of this uh, racism and, and uh, discrimination. There are these common themes around these feelings of invisibility of lack of representation in the curriculum, of lack of representation amongst faculty members and amongst leadership um, in in the you know in the medical schools or in, in the healthcare setting, but I think that the differences that or the specific issues that were brought up by these students that I've also heard time and time again, you know, that are specific to Asian Americans uh, are are these, and so one I think is this idea of of mistaken identity, and you think about you know, um, the way that we grade and, uh, uh, you know, subjectively evaluate students, particularly in the clinical setting, and um, how many times uh, Asian students are mistaken for each other. I know this is sort of, uh, you know, kind of, uh, sometimes used as a joke, but there's only so many times that you can be confused by the other, <laughs> for the other student, the other resident, the other fellow, um, before you start to question the validity of what someone might be writing about you. Um, when they're writing your, your evaluation. Uh, I think there is this potential reiteration of the perpetual foreigner or the model minority stereotypes that occur. And so that question of the in seemingly innocuous question of where are you from and how that can land you know, for someone that has been um, you know, made to feel uh, like an outsider their entire lives um, you know, is something to, to consider. I think the feelings of invisibility and particularly you know, whether or not Asian Americans are included in the, you know, the discussion around diversity and inclusion, I think is something that comes up um, and is, an, is a tension that we need to deal with. And I think overall, there's this, this undercurrent of what I would call gaslighting and that, you know, because Asian Americans are good at getting into medical school or into college, um, there is this doubt that is cast upon them that they can actually be the recipients of experiencing racism or that um, the racism they feel is in their head and it's not actually a thing. And so I, I think those are some potential differences that I gleaned you know, from, from this paper um, and, uh, and my own kind of uh, thinking about uh, what was written here and, uh, and what I've thought about and talked about with students. I also wanted to kind of bring up something that was brought up um, by the students and this concept of disaggregation, because I don't know how many people are, are uh, you know, familiar with the concept of disaggregation, but the disaggregation of data, 
about Asian Americans is this concept that basically acknowledges the fact that Asian American as a concept is actually sort of an invented concept. It was, you know, invented in the late 60s, basically for political and organizational purposes. Um, but it speaks to the idea that although Asian Americans are 6% of the population, you know, there are over 50 countries of origin, there are over 100 language differences of languages, and um, you can see some of them listed there. Um, and I think that all of these different groups experience the American experience or the American hyphenated American experience differently. Um, and that um, we aren't necessarily being attentive to, to those differences either. And so you can see this is um, the, the, that same AAMC uh, year data, um, you know, looking specifically at Asian American students and looking at um, the diversity within the Asian American group and who is represented um, in, in Asian Americans. And so you see that the largest proportion are, are Indian Americans um, followed by Chinese Americans followed by Korean Americans, but there, there's a, a variety, a, a pretty wide variety or heterogen, heterogeneous kind of um, experience here. And this is true of not just medical school student kind of composite, you know, makeup, but this is also true for income. It's also true for educational attainment. And you will see that differ, different sub sort of ethnic, um, Asian ethnicities experience wealth experience academic success to very, very widely varying degrees. And so um, while some Asian ethnicities have uh, uh, average incomes that uh, exceed the, the median U.S. household income, you also have a fair number of uh, uh, Asian American ethnicities which are close or below the poverty line. The same way you have people who are, are, are Asian groups that are getting um, advanced degrees and, and uh, going on to college or, or, or higher versus, um, you know, groups that are really not. Um, and so, you know, thinking about health outcomes, thinking about, um, you know, different disparities, how to manage this data um, is important. Um, you know, this is something that uh, an investigator over at NYU, a woman by the name of Stella Yi, she does a lot of uh, research on disaggregation of of the Asian American uh, subgroup and describing the different experiences uh, with healthcare and in health in this country that different groups, uh, Asian groups experience. And the, the differences are, are striking. And so this is one way to, to think about this. I think this is really interesting, Lou, what you just brought up, because I think it, it leads to some of the complexity of addressing the Asian population. Like, people don't understand like this long list of differentiation here. So I, I'm, I guess I'm speaking personally right now no. that I get, I'm so, you know, I'm so afraid of making a mistake, like from an Asian perspective. And I happen to live in a community now that has a tremendous amount of a large Asian population, my home. And it's interesting. Someone has says to me, well, what's the origin of the Asian population in Great Neck where I live, which is quite large now, especially on the south south side of town? You know, are they basically, you know, where they're from? I, and I couldn't even really answer that question. I don't know enough. So my lack of knowledge makes me anxious that I'm going to make a mistake with an Asian neighbor or an Asian, you know, to bring up any issues. So it's interesting. I never thought about it, what makes me nervous, but seeing this long list of possibilities is probably contributing to some of my discomfort. Look, this is also, look, it gets complicated relatively quickly. It is not lost on the, the irony of, you know, disaggregation requires you to ask an Asian person, where are you from? <laughs> right. Like, so, you know, I, I think let's, you know, uh, you know, I, I think the the, the uh, more open we are about these conversations and the, the difficulties and the nuances of some of these discussions, I think the the better off all of us will, will be. But I, I think certainly there there are lots of um, potential uh, uh, you know nuances to all of this. So, that, so the questions anybody, that we want to yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Questions. Oh, I was going to say, say so the questions that we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead sorry. I just want to say one more thing about um, 
the, the previous slide, Lou, is that um, this brings up the issue about the, the, the common quote of overrepresentation of Asian Americans in, in medicine. Right. So, you know, what is Asian American? Are we all lumped together? And so that then are we then not looking at underrepresented Asians, you know, within because of the subpopulation, right? Because there's, you know, we're all lumped together as one Asian um, group. And so then now we're overrepresented in medicine. But yet, um, if you look at the subpopulation, that is not the case. And then there, there was actually disparities um, um, in medicine. And thank you, Grace. And Emmeline um, Kim said, lack of dis disaggregation in a way makes our API communities more invisible. Do you want to comment on that a little more, Emmeline? If I hope I got you. Yeah, name. it's Emmeline. Emmeline. Um, yeah, I mean, there. I, I feel like there's so many impacts of the lack of disaggregation that I, you know, have had conversations with you know a bunch of folks on this call, but you know, it, it can lead to all sorts of things, right? Like lack of funding, um, you know, even for grants that support research or policies or, um, you know, supportive uh, services for, um, you know, our API communities that need it the most. Um, but in essence, it's kind of built in and it's, it's also very structural in the way that it's captured through whether it's like, you know, um, through kind of like census mechanisms or how we even capture this, the demographics in, um, in, in just general data gathering. So, you know, in a lot of ways, we have to change the way that we capture and collect the data, um, not just the way that we're looking at it, right? Downstream, it has to happen both upstream all the way downstream um, in order to figure out where the, the needs are and how um, different the needs are as well within the communities. Thank you. Yoon, did you want to say something if you unmute? Um, so I used to do a lot of health, racial, ethnic disparity research, uh, a couple issues with Asian American. So there are all these national surveys that are available, public available, for example, NHANES. They did not capture Asian American until 2011. So prior to that, Asians were lumped under um other so one thing is is asian data they start collecting recently and if you look at the data um because the number of sample that they collect is so small uh it's impossible to look at um ethnic inform ethnic information but in terms of doing the research and then trying to publish when i try to submit research uh studies looking at you know asian having worse heart attack outcomes, worse, you know. What's interesting is, is the feedback that I get is, is get a ethnic information and submit it again, which is not even available. So there, there's a lot of barriers, I think, which also makes it harder to, you know, show that, you know, Asian Americans have worse health outcome. But I think people just assume that they're healthy, but some of the studies that I have shown show that they actually have worse health out outcome, even like, you know, compared to African-Americans. Thank you. Thank you. Pratichi, out of time, I'm moving to people who raise their hand. So go ahead. Yeah, no, I think it's really interesting. I think the statistic that really has stuck with me is that 20 to 24 year old age range and the higher rates of suicide and thinking about um, you know, our Asian American young adults that are so vulnerable clearly from that statistic. And disaggregation clearly informs what your interventions will be because within the list that we just showed on the previous slide, there are so many cultural practices, cultural considerations that vary tremendously from one road to the next. And if we don't start to disaggregate, we clearly can inform our interventions and our therapy, you know, how, how we're going to treat this. That being said, it, it gets difficult when you have like 20 rows or 25 rows. Um, and so what are meaningfully relevant, you know, sort of clinically impactful categories? You know, I, I think of it, I do, you know, I was actually just on our um, school, of it, school board DEI committee meeting. And we also in Jericho have a large um, East Asian and South Asian population. And yet when the sort of, you know, thoughts around how do we understand the, the diversity of our students, there was a category of Asian. And I'm like, well, that's, that's not going to really help us understand our student body, because I would say 
50 plus percent of our students are going to pick that. And so how do you start to disaggregate in a way that's meaningful? And I like so far East Asian, South Asian, Southeast Asian with notation of what that means. Um, although it's not perfect, it might be helpful. Um, because I do think there's an in-between between Asian and all of those rows. Thank you. And just Kenneth in the chat says, um, if I remember correctly, only two states disaggregate Asian American in their census, Hawaii and California, which is interesting. I just wondered, um, just to bring some closure, because we're close to over, and just um, anybody have any thoughts what Northwell can do to be more inclusive that we have our um, Berg, I know we have that. We have certain um, clubs at the medical school that relate to this population. And I didn't know if anybody has any other thoughts or thoughts on how there's been lack of inclusion in other ways or anything on that. Um, anything from a more of a education point of view between Northwell and Zucker School of Medicine before we just bring up the last slides. We have about five minutes left. I know some of the people on this call have been involved with the medical school or Grace Lee, go ahead. Grace Lee, Hi. I'm sorry. I'm just... I better raise my hand too. Um, right. So um, I think one of the main ways and as a faculty member would be being more mindful uh, about allyship and just reaching, you know, um, non-Asian non American faculty members to really be aware of of what our medical students may be experiencing and are afraid to vocalize or to share and, and to just really you know, be more mindful and in reaching out, um, whether it's individually in, in a group form. I think that that's something that I, I myself would like to do as well too as, um, as an Asian American faculty member. Great. Um, anybody else want some last comment on efforts we could make within Northwell or Zucker School of Medicine or both um, in this area? Um, anything with GME that anybody who's on? You want to bring up the next slide just at a time and then we can take further questions just to see. Wendy, do you want to go? Sure. Um, okay. Oh, you have limitations. Okay, okay. Well, this will be this will be very quick. Um, so, um, these are the bibliometrics for the article that we reviewed today. Um, I know that uh, there's probably some participants who uh, have not been on a previous Meta Journal Club call. So, bibliometrics measures um, the amount of reach um, that a particular article article has um, in terms of sitebacks, as well as kind of uh, conversations going on in the social media world. Um, the graphic on the left-hand side is taken from um, Plum Metrics, which is available through the Scopus database. It tells you that um, this particular article has been mentioned numerous times on news outlets, which is actually uh, a higher number than what we're used to. Usually it's more captures or more social media conversations, but it's actually um, had a, a pretty high level of news mentions. Um, and then in terms of social media um, conversations, they're have been about 52 shares, likes, and comments. Um, and this data is only looking at um, Facebook. Um, I know that there are other media, social media platforms, but this particular vendor had decided to drop X data um, due to um, the varying changes of the platform. However, with that being said, on the right-hand side, um, is it's a map of the readers um, that are taken from X, which this data comes from, um, uh, another platform called Altmetric. Um, and the readership map tells you where who where people are coming from or where they are um, in terms of who is reading this article. And it's, as you can see here, it's really heavily based in the US. Which I think is interesting. It hasn't made it across the waters uh, at all, really very little. So that's interesting. Um, the last slide, and then I'm gonna have Lou go back to limitations quickly. Um, oh, what's that, Lou? Go ahead. You you go back to limitations and we'll finish up. All right. So these are the questions for discussion. We kind of touch on them. They're worth thinking about, I think, and pondering. Right. The limitations of this study that the authors acknowledged, you know, it was a relatively small study that, you know, there was limited well, representation. We just talked about disaggregation and, you know, clearly there were a limit, limited number of Asian ethnicities. 
So they, they talked about whether or not these sentiments would hold true outside of the COVID-19 pandemic or the new renewed attention to Asian hate. And so potentially repeating this study outside of that, that area and, and, or time frame and, and seeing whether or not these themes remain true uh, was, was an issue. Um, most of the students, like I mentioned, were involved in, with a PAMSA, and so they thought that that would be some some in, uh, place for bias. And they talked about the the potential for social desirability bias, but they tried to make everything completely anonymous and confidential. These are the conclusions that the authors made, not necessarily that uh, I, I made, but um, you can kind of take them for what they were. But I thought the most poignant was that given the pattern of invisibility for Asian American medical students, it follows that their struggles were invisible to the institutions around them. And I think this quote in, from the paper is actually the most poignant of the conclusions you can draw. You are interested in learning more about Asian Americans. I mean, you talk to me in great, about it. I don't know, you can talk to your Asian friends, but these are some, these are some actual books that you could also um, read if you are interested. Um, and uh, that is, uh, that's my talk, I think. Alice, any last words? No, just go to the last, last slide. There. Um, thank, I want to thank our two speakers. Um, um, Lou Miller, of course, has reviewing the auto and Grace Lee for discussion. And um, I hope everybody has some greater insight. I certainly do for my own personal and professional um, roles. And we are doing an article next month that actually I'm an author on. So I'll be the discussant and Dr. Gino Farina, if he can be here, he's also an author on this article and it's dealing with role modeling in the clinical setting, implicit versus explicit role modeling. So um, should be interesting. And the prime author is Mel Anderson. And if you also will get all this deck, you'll get the slide deck and you'll get the survey monkey for feedback and um, any other information you want to tell us. So Wendy put the survey monkey in the chat. She's always on top of everything. So thank you, my trusty partner. And um, you could grab the survey right from the chat now. So we are at the one o'clock hour. This was really a packed session. I, I'm so excited that I, the year started with this and I thank everybody for coming. We had a very large turnout for this. You should know Lou and Grace. Um, I'd say practically double of our usual. So you should feel honored with that. And um, you certainly gave the audience a lot for attending. So thank you. And everybody, I'll see you in February. It's actually February 15th. This is wrong on the slide. It's February 14th is Valentine's Day. So the presentation is February 15th. Thursday is correct. But there'll be a flyer that goes out with this information. But it is the 15th. Thank you, and let me stop recording.